You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Hello, everybody. Al Bolowski here with another edition of Catholic Mysticism and Spirituality, where we talk about all things Catholic, the supernatural aspects of our faith, and uh, topics in general that could affect our faith. And uh, we're going to have a, a show today because, as you know, and it's hard to believe, as we come up on this uh, year anniversary of the lockdowns and the COVID, that we're about to undergo and walk with Jesus next week on his passion. And Palm Sunday is next Sunday. And it's hard to believe that uh, it's been such a strange year for so many people. And to say it's been a difficult year is a great understatement. Loss of life and just the, the... emotional uh, out, uh, outtake that this has had on people. You, you see uh, that the divorce rates, suicides, abuse rates, drug addiction, addiction to pornography, alcoholism is skyrocketing. And at this time right now, it looks like Italy is locked down again and Europe has another outbreak. But the good news here in the States and hopefully for other areas in the world is that there may be some light at the tunnel now with the vaccinations and things happening. We'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, and uh, so, difficult year, great understatement. Seems like a fast year now to me as we approach Holy Week. Again, when we will walk the road to Calvary with Jesus as we celebrate the Triduum with Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and of course, the important, all important for every human being, Resurrection uh, Sunday on Easter. So we're still a little bit off for that, and I'm jumping the gun a little bit, but I thought I would do this show today on St. Faustina uh, because the Sunday after Easter will be Divine Mercy Sunday, and it's an important, important uh great feast day in our Catholic Church, which is such given to us by the merciful, unbelievable mercy of God um, for our sake. And we'll talk a little bit about what the divine mercy is uh, as we go through the show. And, you know, there doesn't seem to be in our society today, by some, a lot of mercy. Uh, Some people certainly... uh, exhibit this incredible virtue, and some, unfortunately, don't. But in our world, it can be, at many times for many of us, especially during the pandemic the last year, a cold and brutal place. I mean, we've all heard the stories, and maybe I've experienced this firsthand of people um, taken to the hospital who are going to pass away and don't even have the consolation of their loved ones around them. So... Truly a difficult time uh, for us, and we're, I guess, uh, not out of the woods by any way, shape, or form yet, but, you know, we need to trust in God's mercy and his love and that he wants to do for us what's best for us and only wants our happiness. And uh, sometimes, unfortunately, due to sin, we get in the way of that. But anyway, so I thought we'd touch a little bit about the Divine Mercy Sunday and the saint who was the one that initiated this great feast through the mercy of our Lord Jesus. Now, some may be aware of St. Faustina because of her famous diary of the Divine Mercy. And it's not an easy book to read, but it's an important one for the church because there's a lot of good stuff in there, and it's hard-hitting. I mean, she talks about hell and purgatory, the stuff that, you know, our society today uh, wants to kind of push to the side, and not acknowledge, and it's difficult. Now, again, this is what we call private revelation, which means as a Catholic, you can believe it or you don't have to. It's not like divine revelation, which is what the scriptures and the tradition teach us, that Like, for instance, Jesus rose from the dead. We believe that. We uh, profess that in our creed. So we have to believe that. We have to believe that. 
And that's the divine revelation, the truth of Jesus Christ, uh, that the church, of course, that he started uh, teaches these truths and teaches about the faith, teaches about morals. So uh, there are things in there from divine revelation as a Catholic we are entitled to believe. But again, private revelation like the divine mercy with St. Faustina, Fatima, or Lourdes, uh, or some of the uh, apparition sites, you don't have to believe in those because those are private. But nonetheless, they're a great gift from God when they're approved by the church now. And, of course, this one uh, has been, of course, and is spread by the church, this Divine Mercy Sunday. So you can, if you choose to follow it, you're in good hands because these, the church, when it makes a determination on whether a saint should be canonized or whether these apparitions and revelations are true and not contrary to the faith, they, they don't miss and they can't miss. So you can feel safe and assured in that if you do uh, tend to have a devotion to those uh, uh, private revelations that are approved by the church. You know, it's just going to enhance your faith and lead you closer to Jesus because, again, there's nothing contrary. All right, so let's begin with St. Faustina. She was born Helena Kowalska, and she was born on August 25th in 1905 in Gladwit, Poland to Stanislaw and Mariana Kowalska. She was the third of ten children. Now, the father had a trade. He was a carpenter. And yet, like many in the trades at that particular time, and in these times, you, you, uh, she was born in 1905, as I said, that they were very poor, even with a trade. Many of the people had, uh, that had these trades, these men, had difficulties making ends meet. So it certainly wasn't an easy living. And, of course, any of the trades, whether it be carpentry, carpentry or plumbing or electrical work, they're, they're difficult. They take a physical toll as well as a mental toll on one's uh, psyche and body. So, you know, you would hope to be well rewarded and compensated, but back in those times, you know, maybe not necessarily true of everyone. So... It was a difficult time for the Kowalska family and for many people in Poland as well in the country because if you look at the time frame here in 1905, 1900, what was going to be coming was World War I very quickly from 1914 to 1918. And after that war, um, the Polish people had it very difficult. You know, the Polish people in general have had it difficult um, at one time not even being on the world map for or, many, 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 many years and uh, not acknowledged and uh, had uh, a great deal of uh, prejudice against it um, by other European powers. So Poland during this time after World War I was fighting for its borders, which wasn't, again, new to them, as I mentioned, and trying to maintain some type of st stability in the country uh, led to very difficult times. But one thing about the Polish people, whether it's economic hardship or loss of their freedom, is that they have always kept the faith. Their faith to Jesus Christ, their faith to the Holy Catholic Church that Jesus started. And so maintaining this, this was certainly true for the Polish people, and certainly true for the Kowalskas as a family. You know, it's a very interesting thing, I think, in our day today and throughout history to see how many poor people, despite having so many crosses, so much suffering, maintain their faith, their hope, and their joy in God. And one of the reasons is they have no material goods to distract them. Now, look at us today, especially so blessed by God in this country. We have incredible amounts of material wealth and goods that certainly distract us, all kinds of entertainment to distract us, all kinds of technologies to distract us. The poor, they don't have those things. Now, I'm not saying it's a good thing to be poor because, again, the sufferings are enormous. But to be poor in spirit is maybe a lesson in humility that here in this country and in other industrial countries that are so wealthy can learn from to come back in closer to God 
Because I know if you're a follower of the show, you know, we talk about that all the time, that everything that happens uh, here, like what's happening in the pandemic, is so far uh, beyond us because of the supernatural battle that we're involved that we need to take to the, the true remedy, which is Jesus Christ. We need to acknowledge our sins, repent from those sins, do some penance, call to heaven and ask for that help, and we will be healed. Our nation will be healed. Things will be restored. But until we do that, you know, we're kind of swimming upstream. I mean, we do some good things through the grace of God that he's given us gifts to do things. But in the end result, we are totally dependent on him, depending on, you know, despite what some people in uh, this world think. So one lesson that we can learn from St. Faustina, and the poor in general, is to try and become detached from trying and trying to accumulate more things as if that is what's going to buy us happiness. Certainly last year at this time when this disease was raging, or was about to rage, we saw that that accumulation of uh, material things wasn't really that important because of the disconnect we had from each other. And still, there's still social distancing. There's still masks being worn. And we'll see how it all pays out. But, you know, hopefully we're learning some lessons and they won't go, you know, unlearned. Well, back to St. Faustina. She felt the calling when she was about seven, year, seven years old while she was attending Exposition of the Blessed Sacrament. And she actually wanted to enter a convent after completing school. But her parents refused her. So when she turned 16, she went to work as a housekeeper, like many uh, young people did that day, to support not only herself, but her family. And that happens to so many of us that uh, this happened to St. Faustina. We have really good intentions that we have set to try and follow God. And we, we really want to do that. But the cares of daily life, certainly, whether it was back in St. Faustina's time or in our time now, can cause us to lose our focus on Jesus. And that's when we run into trouble. When we lose our focus on our Creator, on the Giver, and then we start to give our attention, the gifts He's given us, our time, talent, and treasure, to other false gods, whatever they be, whether they be work or, or alcohol or drugs or entertainment, whatever it is, we have that capacity then to create a great deal of havoc in our world because we will be just looking at serving ourselves and not serving others. And certainly, uh, as we are in Lent and we're coming to the Passion, we can see that Jesus certainly came to be a servant, to be ransomed for many, and wasn't self-serving. So it's always difficult. It's tough for us to do, to die to self like that. So St. Faustina, you know, got caught up in, in all that and in turn went on with her life like any Polish maiden would at that time. <clears throat> Excuse me. The turning point in her life took place, though, when she was 19 in 1924. You see, she attended a dance with her sister Natalia, and it was at a park in a town called Lodz. And while she was dancing and having fun in the revelry, she had a vision of Jesus as he suffered. And Jesus actually spoke to her and asked her the question, how long do I have to wait for you? And then Jesus instructed her to go to Warsaw and enter a convent. Now, what took to be an incredible, tremendous leap of faith, St. Faustina just up and left for the 85-mile trip without telling her parents, not knowing anyone there, and wearing just her dress, she went. Went to Warsaw without anything. What a leap of faith. Just trusting in what she saw and heard was real. And that God would take care of her. That God only wanted what was best for her. And to make her happy. 
Now, sometimes the faith that these saints had, the trust that they have, like St. Faustina had in Jesus, don't seem very prudent to us. And at times, let's be frank, they may seem even foolhardy. But when we look and see whether it was, say, St. Faustina or St. John Danny, St. Uh, Joseph Cupertino, any of these saints that just took God for what he said and altered their lives, in many cases 180 degrees, to do what God wanted, were enabled to uh, accomplish many, many incredible things, supernatural healings and miracles and wonders, and led others to holiness. And what we look at when we see that is what God actually accomplishes through this faith and trust. Because with that faith and trust in the saints, God is able to open up the doors to the Holy Spirit and do great things, great, unbelievable, unimaginable things through these people. You know, give you a couple examples, you know, because again, it does seem foolhardy and doesn't seem prudent to us. How many of us, if we had a vision or had Jesus talk to us, would do what Saint Joan of Arc did, for instance? She's told that she has to go and lead France to its freedom from the English at 17 years old. St. Francis of Assisi helps restore the church during a tumultuous time in her history. And St. Paul, John Paul II helped break the communist yoke it had over Poland without firing a shot or a drop of blood during the height of the Russian uh, military power. And this is what Jesus can accomplish through that faith and trust and can accomplish through us if we have that kind of faith and trust. But it isn't easy. It isn't easy, and that's very difficult for us, uh, especially today, to have that kind of uh, faith and trust because we're also many times uh, not just addition to looking to be prudent, but we also are very uh, incredulous when it comes to the supernatural. We have so much technology, so much science has seen to... Uh, explain away that we don't have that childlike faith like a lot of saints, like St. Saint Faustina, had to accomplish through God's grace these great things because we don't trust that much in God. We trust in ourselves. So when she arrives, St. Faustina goes to the first church that she sees, and it's St. James. And she asks the priest, Father Dabrowski, for help. And when we look at this, this is another common trait of the saints we see. Not just faith and trust, but boldness. I mean, think about it. As I mentioned, St. Joan of Arc being bold and going to see the king and telling people, you don't understand, I am going to lead your armies to freedom. And St. Francis, who just was incredibly, uh, while peaceful and loving, he was also a bold a bold saint. Saint Anthony of Padua at one time was willing to die as a martyr to go convert Muslims. And we see so much of this with the saints that they feel this incredible uh, courage and strength that they get from God, from uh, the grace of the Holy Spirit, to be able to stand up for him and be bold without the fear of any consequences. And it's incredible. It's an incredible gift, and it's a incredible common trait of the saints, and one that we too, if we nurture it, can also have that kind of boldness and, and faith and uh, confidence and trust. Now, like St. Faustina, we also need to be bold in living out that faith and proclaiming it even when we are mocked, ridiculed, and dismissed as one of those uh, religious nuts. And sometimes that happens to 
in our own family, to those that are closest uh, to us. And it's not always easy to take a stand for what we believe, whether it's abortion, uh, assisted suicide, saying that marriage is between a man and a woman, whatever situation we may find ourselves in, when we come head to head with the powers of darkness that don't want the light to be let out, we're going to run into this. So it requires this boldness, this courage. And it's not easy, again, to take a stand for what we believe, as I said. And that's why we need to pray for this boldness and courage. Now, Father Dabrowski arranges uh, St. Faustina to stay with a Mrs. Lipsulkawa until she can actually find a convent to go to. And it wasn't for lack of trying because she approached several convents and was turned on by all, even being told by one they didn't accept maids in her, uh, alluding to her poverty. But St. Faustina perseveres and is finally accepted by the Sisters of Mercy, but on one condition, she must pay for her own habit. Now, she goes to Warsaw it has nothing. And look at the childlike trust and perseverance she showed. St. Faustina shows us two important uh, points for our faith walk and the time we live in. Jesus, as we know in Scripture, tells us that they who persevere will be saved. And we live in an age of entitlement where many are feel they are owed. Things that past generations had to work hard, swim and save to get, like a home or a vehicle. We get today without even thinking twice about it. So perseverance was critical to that past generation that grew up during the Great Depression and went right into World War II. Today, our society seeks comfortability as a top priority. And the way it can make things easier is to live our life, especially when the going gets tough. St. Faustina, after being rejected so many times by these convents, could have wondered, well, God, maybe this was a mistake. It's not what you really wanted. And she could have easily, easily given into doubt and discouragement. And she could have quit and went back home. But she didn't. And the lesson is neither should we when we are in doubt or discouragement comes our way. Whether it's prayers we don't think are being answered or frustration that no matter how hard we try, we can't seem to go closer to Jesus or a ministry. And we get frustrated when we, we do get involved in doesn't seem to produce what we thought it should, what we thought, not what God thought, not in God's time, but we thought and in our time. And that just doesn't apply to um, work. It can also apply to our relationships and other facets of our life if we're not careful. But if we can ask St. Faustina for her intercession, for person perseverance and the childlike trust she had, we are going to open a door for Jesus to use all these stumbling blocks that we have in our lives, whatever they be, be, to do great and exciting things in our lives that will amaze us. The key for us is we have to trust in him and keep plugging, always trying to move forward like Faustina. Now, we look at that and we see her, how her perseverance pays off. And through hard work as a maid, saves enough money to buy her habit. And is accepted to the convent April 30th, 1926. And she is clothed in her habit and takes the name Sister Maria Faustina of the Blessed Sacrament. Her name may be the form of a Christian martyr, they think, Faustinius who was killed in 120 A.D. And she may have gotten that name from uh, that man. And in 1928, she completed her novitiate 
and takes her vows with her parents there. So that perseverance and faith paid off in a big way, in a big way for you and I, too. Because through St. Faustina comes this beautiful gracing and mission of the divine mercy. So she's posted to a con uh, convent in Vilnius. And there she served as a cook. And she meets a father, Michael Sacco. Now, after she was transferred to a town called Plock in 1930, she begins to show signs of tuberculosis and has to recuperate at a farm owned by the order. St. Faustina spends her time in deep prayer and offers her sufferings with Jesus' sufferings on the cross. Like, mother, like many other saints, many other saints, she didn't have it easy. And the saints don't. We talked about this on other shows that it's not as the artist depict them in a prayerful position on their knees, ice, with this angelic glow looking toward heaven. No, the saints were flesh and blood characters that, like you and I, struggle with the same things. Maybe the technology is different. But we struggle with the same sins, the same uh, cupiscence, trying to do good, trying to, you know, live a life according to the Lord, yet having one foot in the, on the earth and the other in the Lord. So we need to be aware of that because many of the saints did not have it easy. And that is too an understatement. And she's not going to go let this suffering of Jesus go to waste. Oh no. She's going to offer up her deepest prayer, her deepest desires of her heart in the quiet sufferings. And that way these sufferings united with Christ to the cross do not appear uh, to go to waste. And we know they don't. You know, one of the things as human beings, and one of the things that uh, is responsible for people not believing in God, is that we often wonder why God allows suffering. And when we look and delve deep in this, God doesn't want us to suffer. And why people suffer, sometimes seemingly for no reason, is one of the mysteries of life. We may not get an answer until we're in heaven. That's all right. It's okay not to have all the information, knowledge. There still is mystery in the supernatural world, in our world. Science hasn't proven anything beyond a pale of a doubt. So with that being said, we need to offer up our suffering, even when they seem unexplainable. And we cry out to God, why have you abandoned me, Lord? Why have you abandoned me? And we trust that God will make all things right. And we unite this suffering to Jesus' suffering on the cross, and he will do unbelievable things with this. You know, this certainly isn't a, a church teaching um, that it's just my opinion. But, you know, when we, when we use these uh, sufferings, I like to have this image that, you know, through these sufferings, one day, Lord willing, we make it to heaven, that someone we don't even know, maybe from the other side of this earth one day, because we offered up a suffering to Jesus, and this is my opinion point, that maybe... Someone will walk up to us in heaven, hug us, and say, you know, you don't know me, but on the day that you were suffering so much and offered it up to Christ on his cross was what got me here. Because our crosses, our sufferings, united to Jesus, can be used for the salvation of soul. Christ is that merciful. He's that merciful. And he will use our trials and tribulations if we're willing to, as the famous saying goes, offer it up to bring people to him. Because that's when Jesus was lifted up on the cross, that's what he did. He drew all people of every race, uh, tongue, nation, and background to himself. And we can participate in that. So suffering, as hard as it is, does have merit. And we mustn't lose sight of that, even when it's terrible suffering, like so many have had with this pandemic. 
But remember, God wants us, wants the best for us, and wants for us to be happy. Not just in eternal life, but now. You know, another thing is, is when we look at these mysteries of our faith and just let it go, a lot of times we're going to be a lot happier with that. But the other flip side of that is, you know, a lot of our suffering is caused by the choices we make through the gift of free will that God has given us. He will never go against that free will gift because he wants us to choose him to love him on our own, on our free will. And basically, when we go against his commandments and the universal laws of his creation that he has set down, we are going to be the cause of not only our own suffering, but others. And we've seen this played out in history many, many times over. But again, it doesn't have to be useless. And like Faustina, when we unite it to Jesus' sufferings, it can accomplish great things. You know, not just the salvation of soul, but conversion. And as I said, can you imagine if you were in heaven and someone comes up to you and hugs you saying, you don't know me. But one day when you were hurting, you got me here. Oh, how awesome that day will be. Oh, all right. Let's flip over to a Sunday on February 2nd, 22nd, 1931. Because while in her cell, Jesus appears wearing a white garment with red and white waves emanating from his heart. And the red signifies the blood and the water which came out of Jesus' side when pierced by that lance at Calvary. So those red and white rays are quite important because he shed his blood for us on the cross, and yet through baptism, through water, we are cleansed. All the things through our baptism is of original sins wiped out. Sins are forgiven. And we have an indelible seal that God has given us on our soul that marks us as a child of God which nothing can take, nothing can erase it, nothing. So this is a very powerful imagery. And that water and blood came out of Jesus' side, of course, when he was pierced by the lance by the soldier at Calvary. And what Jesus wants to show St. Faustina and in turn us is when he says to her, he tells her, I would like you to paint an image according to the pattern you see. With the signature, Jesus, I trust in you. He tells her, I desire this image to be venerated first in your chapel and then through the whole world. I promise the soul that venerates this image will not perish. And he also told her he wanted the image to be solemnly blessed on the first Sunday after Easter Sunday. And that Sunday's that Sunday after Easter Sunday, to be the Feast of Mercy. Now, wow! We see what an awesome gift this merciful Father has for us, that he's going to pour out his mercy upon us, shower his mercy upon us from heaven, so that we can have this relationship with him and one day spend an eternity with him. And after this time, St. Faustina now is going to begin to have many visions and messages from Jesus, which, to the book I alluded to earlier, will eventually be published as the Diary of St. Maria Faustina Kowalska, Divine Mercy in My Soul. Uh, an incredible, incredible uh, book. Again, not an easy read. There's a lot of difficult stuff, a lot of hard-hitting stuff in there. But you and I as Catholic Christians, we need to be uh, challenged in our faith. It's not just all about warm fuzzies and feeling good and what I get out of Mass. It's about serving. It's about honoring and worship the Creator who gave us the gift of life, who gives us the gift of salvation. If only we are open to taking it and seizing it. Now, I mentioned a moment ago that Jesus wanted St. Faustina to paint the image. But there's a problem. She doesn't know how to paint. And there will be tougher crosses ahead for her. For instance, when she tells her confessor, Father Sopko, she is 
actually seeing and conversing with Jesus, he has to be very careful and very prudent. So what does he do? He orders a bunch of psychological evaluations, which St. Faustina passes with fine colors and is declared to have a sound mind. This may seem unkind at first, but the Catholic Church in her wisdom, again, must exhaust every natural explanation when determining if the event is of supernatural origin. They can't afford to miss because it starts a domino effect and people would question whether any of what they say is a miracle it really is. And we look here and see that St. Faustina, who had to suffer from her fellow sisters who doubted her, like they would us, and not believe her. That this was very difficult for her because they didn't believe in her vision. They doubted she was having them. And in addition, she was accused of being lazy, shirking her duties. But they didn't know how sick she was. So St. Faustina bore all this physical and mental pain heroically. And in turn, she shows us how we can bear wrongs done against us by co-workers, classmates, friends, and family members. First, like Faustina, we need to forgive them. And then we need to pray for them. We don't try to deny the fact that we've been hurt. But rather than respond with a sense of vengeance, we can turn to the Lord and ask for mercy for those who persecute us, as he did on the cross. And this can set us free, free from holding on to resentment, to let go and let Jesus fill us with his grace so that we can be led to a deeper conversion and a deeper relationship with him. And also, our prayers can open up that grace for those we are praying for that can literally change lives. For we know with God, as the angel Gabriel told Mary, nothing is impossible for God. Nothing. So a very important lesson for us to learn. Now, around these times with these increased visions and conversations with God, Father Sapko begins to have confidence in her. And he keeps the diary and records those messages which she uh, had, as I mentioned. And the image is first displayed during Easter ceremonies, and that was April 25th through April 28th in 1934. Also displayed during the Easter uh, Mass at uh, the 25th and 28th of April in 1934. So it was starting to take off. And, you know, it's funny because Father Sapka, who ordered these psychiatric tests, was the one that eventually, you know, had her keep the diary, and he recorded the messages. And he introduced her to the artist who would paint the picture, uh, an artist by the name of Eugene Pesnerowski. And he does paint the image. And again, that image is displayed during Easter, Easter week, April, in 1934. And in addition, Father Sapko will deliver the first Mass and Sermon of Divine Mercy on April 26, 1935. So you can see that this wasn't, the Divine Mercy had a little problem with acceptance in the beginning. It was difficult. But the Lord came through, and we can't, you know, no matter how much we start, try to uh, stall His work, we can't. We can't. Even if it takes a long time, as the divine mercy tradition did to take a long time to be cemented in uh, the church. Now, in that year, 1935, while she was in the chapel, she had a vision of an angel that was sent to chastise a certain city. And she saw the Holy Trinity, and she felt the grace of Jesus within her. And seizing this grace, she began to plead for mercy. 
And she heard the words interiorly, Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we, of course, may recognize that as that beginning prayer. And we follow that with an atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. So this comes right from Jesus. Right from Jesus. And that's a very powerful thing. And then on those beads, we also pray, uh, for the sake of this sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. So this is what it's about. Jesus is not just having mercy on the individual soul, but on the entire world, in man's entire history, himself. How awesome is that? How incredible is that? And going back to the story uh, of that angel that was going to chastise a certain city, when she repeated this prayer that Jesus gave us, that angel became helpless and could not carry out the punishment. And the next day in the chapel, she heard the voice say, instruct her how to recite the prayer the Lord later called the chaplet. So here we begin to see the beginnings of that Divine Mercy chaplet. Now, this time, after um, have mercy on us, we added the words, and on the whole world. And in 1936, Father Sapko writes the first brochure of the Chaplet of Divine Mercy. Faustina also, I don't know if you know this, had visions of heaven and the suffering souls in purgatory. And she saw the Virgin Mary that actually tended to souls in purgatory, giving them great relief. And St. Faustina herself, this chosen one of God in her vocation, became seriously ill herself in 1936. And she was moved to a sanatorium where she spent the final two years of her life praying the chaplet for the conversion of sinners and even had a vision of the Feast of Divine Mercy being attended by large crowds in the local chapel and Rome. And she died on October 5th, 1938, at the young age of 33. She was canonized as St. April 30th in the year 2000 after an approved miracle by the Vatican of Maureen Deegan of Massachusetts. Maureen was praying at the tomb of St. Faustina in the Basilica of the Divine Mercy in Krakow. For she wanted, like any, anyone would, uh, to be healed of a certain condition she had. And this condition was called lymphedema. And what that is, is an, it's an extreme fluid retention. And she had to go incredible hardship with this, uh, this uh, illness. She would undergo 10 surgeries. And if that wasn't enough, she lost her leg. But when she was at that tomb, she heard a voice say, ask for my help and I will help you. She asked and the help, she asked and the pain stopped and she was indeed healed. And after five Boston doctors and 20 additional testimonies from witnesses, the Vatican approved the miracle she needed for her canonization. And again, the church has to be careful. It's got to be sure that these miracles are unexplainable, that they are a, uh, of supernatural origin. And in this case, a great gift from God, confirmed by five Boston doctors and 20 additional uh, testimonies from witnesses. So it's uh, a very powerful, powerful devotion. Now, we look at our world today, and we see that the world desperately needs this incredible gift of mercy that Jesus has given us in the Chapel of Divine Mercy and the Feast of Divine Mercy. So the Chaplet and the Feast of Divine Mercy are an incredible one-two punch. Incredible one-two punch. And we'll take a look right now at some of the promises that Jesus has given us if we pray the Chaplet. 
and participate in that first Sunday after Easter on the Feast of Divine Mercy. If the chap, Jesus told St. Faustina this, if the chaplet is prayed at the hour of death, even just once, even for the most hardened sinner, Jesus will stand between that person and the Father as the judge of merciful Savior and not the judge of divine justice. Wow! That is so powerful because while Jesus is most merciful, what we tend to play down and ignore is the fact is he, he is also just judge. And justice has to be done even though our modern world wants to folk, just focus on Jesus as the merciful Savior and not the judge of divine justice. But, um, and by a devotion to praying this chaplet, Jesus said he will defend every soul who does this at the hour of their death with his own glory. So look at these two things right off that we have in this great mercy that Jesus in his love for us has given us. That, that chaplet, if you pray that, for instance, one of your loved ones or someone you know is in a hospital, and during this pandemic time you may not be able to go see them, but you can still pray for them. And he will judge them as the judge of mercy, not justice. Wow, is that powerful. I mean, that is that should be a number one thing we do when those around us are dying or when it is our time to have people pray the chaplet for us. And then when you have this devotion, Jesus himself, he will uh, defend every soul who at the hour of their death will be filled with his glory. How incredible, how incredible is that? It's awesome, awesome. Jesus also said that we can use it to pray for the conversion of sinners. Brothers and sisters, we've got family members. We've got friends. We've got athletes, entertainers, people we don't know, politicians, people in power, judges. We need to pray for the conversion of sinners. And we can pray on this chapel, which is so powerful for the conversion of sinners and for ourselves for conversion and continued conversion. And this is an incredible gift of this chaplet in God's mercy to let us be able to do this. What a powerful prayer that if we take time, if we do this devotion and we have a devotion to divine mercy, we take and add on the intention for conversion of sinners, the Lord will honor that. He said so himself. Another great thing of this great devotion of divine mercy is that at the three o'clock hour, if we immerse ourselves, if only for a moment, in the Lord's passion, he will refuse the soul nothing if it is in, if it is in his divine will. Now think about that. There we go. Let's just go back to that conversion for a minute. So if we just immerse ourselves 3 o'clock one day and immerse ourselves in what the Lord suffered, especially in this Lent, especially with Palm Sunday coming up, just for a moment, he will refuse the soul nothing. And especially with conversions, because Jesus, you know, and I know, he does not want to lose anyone. He wants all people to himself. Remember what we said earlier in the show, that when he was raised up on the cross at Calvary, when he was lifted up, he drew all people to himself. If they wish, if they want to follow him, if they believe that he is Lord and Savior. So we pray for that conversion. And if we do that, at that 3 o'clock hour, the hour of mercy, a good time, you know, traditionally, that's when the chaplet is prayed. We can get these conversions. We could see great things for our soul that the Lord will not deny. Again, if it is in his divine will. Because we know that God is not a vending machine. God, I need a new car. God, I need financial uh, windfalls. God, I need this. God, I need that. It's not a vending machine. Again, God knows what truly will make us happy, and he only wants the best of us. 
and the thing he wants the most is for us to be with him at the end of our life. And that is a very powerful thing and a great gift of God's mercy and love. Now, for those that have this devotion and for those that want to spread the devotion of divine mercy, Jesus has said at the hour of their death, he will not be a judge but merciful Savior. Brothers and sisters, that is what we want. You see, there's, there's a tendency today that we rely, it's, it's called like the sin of presumption, right? We rely so much on mercy that there's this type of universal salvation that everybody gets to heaven, everyone, because of God's mercy. He is so merciful. He loves everybody so much that everybody, despite whatever they do, whatever sins they commit, whatever life they live, is just going to get to heaven. See, modern man has changed one of the scripture verses quite a bit. Jesus said in scripture that the road to salvation is narrow and the road to perdition is wide. Well, we've changed it as modern man. The road to heaven is wide and the road to hell is very, very narrow. And that's not what he said. And the other thing, so that becomes a sin, excuse me, of presumption where we just rely, well, you know what, I don't really need to do anything uh, to follow Christ because he's so merciful, you know, I can live the kind of life I want and he's still going to save me. That's, that, is, wow, you've got to be very careful there. Very careful there because you could lose your soul. Because the thing we miss is that he's also the God of, the, of judgment, of divine justice. And that being said, justice has to pay out in the end. You cannot have all this evil all this man's inhumanity the man done. And it's just, it can't figure that way. There has to, right has to be, there's got to be righteousness. Right has to be made right. Wrongs have to be made accountable. And I know we live in an age where there doesn't seem to be a lot of accountability. But there will be. There will be at the end of time. And that's why we need so much if we spread this devotion to divine mercy, that we want Jesus to be the merciful, merciful Savior and not just judge. Because let's be honest, we've all done stuff in our lives that we have to be held accountable for. And we've got to really hope and pray to stay away from mortal sin so that we don't lose our soul. And that's why if you are spreading this divine mercy or if you, you would, you know, want after listening to the show to do it, um, it's a great gift that God will judge again as merciful Savior, not just judge. And again, the beautiful image of Jesus painted by that artist with the, the Jesus with his hands extended and the rays coming out, the blood and water, that beautiful image, Jesus, I trust in you with those uh, words added that the souls who venerate that image, they will not perish. Again, uh, all these great gifts from Jesus that through the chaplet you will obtain everything you ask. Again, it's in compliance with Jesus' will. Now, if you participate in the Feast of Divine Mercy, and I, I'm going to mention that again, it's a service, it's not a Mass. The Sunday after Easter, by going to confession, going to Mass, and receiving Jesus in the Eucharist, in a state of grace, you will obtain complete forgiveness of sin and the punishment due them. How awesome, how awesome is that? Because that means, you see, when we sin, let's say I stole $50 from someone. Now, I can go back to that individual and say, you know what, I, I stole the 50 bucks from you. I'm going to ask for your forgiveness. And... Uh, We'll let it go at that because I kind of used the $50 for something I needed. Well, you see, yes, I go to confession. I ask for the forgiveness of my sins, and they all are forgiven. Those slates are like clean. But there also is a temporal punishment that's due. You see, in that case I used the $50, I have to pay that man back. I have to make restitution for stealing that $50 because he's on the outs of it. So in our sins, there is a temporal punishment due. 
And even though they're forgiven through the beautiful sacrament of confession, we have to make rep restitution for that temporal punishment. And see, that's what we have as a great gift, again, in God's mercy, of purgatory. Because many of us, many of us, many of us at a particular judgment are not going to die with an unstained soul. And that means we've got to be purified. That scale of rust of that sin that's still on our soul, to kind of use an analogy, needs to be flaked off. And that's what happen is, happens as we do our time in purgatory. We start to see the rust disappear and the purity of our souls come forth as the rust is being stripped away. So that's our purgatory time to make us holy, to make us pure, to take away any attachment we still, when we die, may have to sin. And that's why this is such a great feast, because all that time, that punishment will, that temporal punishment, is off the slate. Now, my gosh, is that a great gift, and I strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you to take advantage of this great mercy because the odds are most of us are probably going to end up in purgatory and we're going to need, we're going to need to have our souls clean. And how great a gift that we can spend it great peace through God's mercy. Reduce that time. Isn't that incredible? I mean, think about how much God loves us that he would give us this great gift. And sadly, Many Catholics, I, I think, don't take advantage of this. And this is a great indulgence. And also, with that indulgence, I should mention that I believe it's a creed. And uh, our Father, for the intentions of the Holy Father, that uh, has to be done to get this great indulgence for the forgiveness of sins and the punishment due them, to, to them. So again, I, if you, you have no detachment of sin, you go and... Uh, participate in the service uh, the Sunday after Easter, go to confession, go to Mass, receive Jesus in the Eucharist in a state of grace, grace detach from sin, and that uh, creed and uh, our Father for the Holy Father. That forgiveness of sins, the punishment due them, gone. I mean, wow! Wow, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this great gift. Thank you, St. Paul, for being open that God could use you as an instrument to bring this great gift of mercy. Thank you, John Paul, St. John Paul the Great, for letting this mercy, this great feast of the divine mercy, be accepted by the church and allow us to participate in this great gift of mercy. You know, as we close off the show, it's an interesting time period uh, when we look at this and we see that St. Faustina, uh, St. Maximum Colby, and St. John Paul the Great were all born during these, this tumultuous time in our world in the 30s and 40s uh, with World War II and with Poland, as I mentioned, coming out of World War I. Uh, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible that we have such great saints out of this country, and we thank the Lord for not only these three great saints, but for all the saints throughout history and the saints God's rising up now. And you may be one of them. Yes, you. That God is going to do great things in your life and take you on an adventure in your wildest imagination. You cannot imagine if you're open to his grace and his grace. And my prayer for you tonight as we close is that you are and that God can work through you to become a great saint and lead others to holiness and through God's gift of grace, our eternal salvation. So as we close out the show, please take advantage of this great feast. Read about it more if you want. Uh, venerate the image. Become involved. Spread the devotion. And certainly uh, participate in that feast of divine mercy this Sunday after Easter. I can assure you, you will not be sorry because the promises come from Jesus Christ himself. Good night, and God bless. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio.
I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.